Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cynthia Ippoliti, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Learning Services here at the library. And I wanted to thank everyone for joining us on this less than lovely afternoon, but wonderful and exciting topic. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Isabel Alvarez Sancho, who is going to be our speaker today. And uh, Dr. Alvarez Sancho is an assistant professor of Spanish in the Department of Languages and Literatures at Oklahoma State University where she teaches and researches on 20th and 21st century Spanish cultural studies. She's completing a monograph that analyzes literature written in exile after the Spanish Civil War. Her second book project studies formulations of the future in 21st century Spanish film. Dr. Alvarez Sancho has a PhD in Hispanic cultural studies from Michigan State University. Originally from Spain, she taught Spanish for refugees in Spain and worked for the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation in Bosnia and Herzegovina before beginning her doctoral studies. The title of her presentation is, What Does Neutrality Mean? Spain from the Great War to the Spanish Civil War. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alvarez Sancho. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and a special thanks to Cynthia Ippoliti for organizing this lecture and to all the library staff uh, for taking care of the technical matters. Um, I'd like to start by remembering Professor David Oberhelman, who was the soul of this great world cycle and recently passed away. Um, both faculty and students of the Department of Languages and Literatures remember and miss him, his willingness to work with faculty and students at all levels, his successful effort to modernize M Edmund Lowe's collection of books and movies in languages other than English, his charm during the library sessions, and the story he liked to tell about when he met Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian writer, in Lubbock when he was a kid. Um, his knowledge of Spanish language, literature, cinema, and food, uh, and his never-ending generosity made him not only the most wonderful librarian I have ever worked with, but also one of my best friends in Stillwater. Um, so in order not to get too sad, let's talk about war instead. Um, although not exactly war, because I'm here to talk about neutrality. Um, in contrast, to the myriad ways conflict has been dealt with, neutrality doesn't usually receive much attention. However, I'd like for us today to reflect about what is neutrality and what are its ramifications, to consider how being neutral is a significant position, one that is at the core of many important debates in our society. For example, the neutrality of the government towards certain issues related to economy, religion, society, or foreign policy, to name a few, is one of the main points of debate across the political spectrum. Neutrality is often criticized. Uh, if you have seen or attended any of the recent political marches, you might have noticed some signs condemning people who are neutral. Uh, and these are some of the signs that you might have seen. And that's like a famous uh, quote by Desmond Tutu, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Um, I also wanted to add some, uh, that's the headline of a recent article in a Spanish newspaper, El Imperio del Extremo Centro, which means the empire of the extreme center, <laughs> which is also criticizing neutrality. Um, on the other hand, neutrality sometimes seems like the better route and is even portrayed as such in popular culture. For example, in the recent movie Black Panther, one of the points of descent between the two aspiring kings was neutrality. One king, the good guy, embodied a preservationist neutral position, wishing to maintain Wakanda separated from the rest of the world, whereas the other one, the villain, envisioned an interventionist policy as his duty. Is neutrality good? Is it the opposite of good or both? Is it just 
Does neutrality equal freedom? Is it an active or a passive position? Can neutrality have adjectives, such as those given to it in Spain during the Great War? And some of them were benevolent neutrality, political neutrality, preventive neutrality, expectant neutrality, or even fetal neutrality. Moreover, is it possible to be truly neutral? Can we form an interpretation of this phenomenon, avoiding, as George Scher recommends, quote, the twin pitfalls of construing the principle of neutrality as too weak to be interesting and too strong to be practical, practicable, unquote. Spain during the Great War is a great case study to reflect on these questions. And this is the outline I suggest to follow. Um, as an introduction, we need to briefly situate ourselves. Precisely because I'm talking about neutrality, I choose to start by situating myself, aware that I'm contravening academic conventions that presuppose the objectivity of the speaker. Uh, something similar to what has been called by the colonial theories, the hubris of the zero point. I will follow facts, but my knowledge is situated. Afterwards, I will situate Spain in space and time. Don't worry, for the sake of clarity, I will follow the convention that separates these two concepts. Um, then we will be ready to ask, what did neutrality mean in this particular case? I will briefly introduce the reasons why Spain remained neutral during the entire Great War. Then, of the many facets of the war polyhydron, we will focus first on the diplomatic role of King Alfonso XIII and his Oficina Pro Cautivos, or Office for Captives, during the war. This was a really valuable contribution and something we would expect a neutral country to do, but the story is longer. Second, we'll explore the submarine war which sank many neutral Spanish ships and the role of spies. This point will illustrate how the war infiltrated neutral Spain so it's a particular realization of a global phenomenon. Finally, I will show examples of the heated debates that the Great War sparked in Spain, so harsh that this era has been called a civil war of words. And I will give an overview of the events that follow that civil war of words to the civil war of bodies that happened several years later. This last point will show how Spain made sense of the war and of its position in the modern world, what ideas were generated during this period and what ideas were discarded. And I promise to take as little time as possible. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to start uh, talking about me because I have a confession to make. I'm not a historian. I'm a literature scholar. Uh, my field commonly uses history as a background to understand the culture and the texts of a period. Um, however, as you heard in my introduction, I study war narratives and narratives of the future. During the first part of my professional career, I taught the Spanish for refugees in Spain, and later I taught Spanish at a university in Mostar, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Most of my students, both in Spain and Bosnia, had lived a civil war. That's how I became very interested on how people become enemies. And in graduate school, I decided to study how that happened in my own country, Spain. As you might know, in Latin, there are two words to define enemy. Hostis, your opponent or the enemy of the state, and inimicus, your personal enemy. My research tries to answer the question of how somebody who wasn't your inimicus, your personal enemy, who might even be your friend, suddenly becomes your hostess, your opponent. 
Um, my main focus is to study how the stories we tell shape our reality and create powerful attachments that make us envision some people as our friends and some others are our enemies. And those stories sometimes have to do with the future we imagine for our community, which for some people needs to bring something new and fresh, and for some others it ought to return to what is considered a greater past. And this is what I'd like to explore with the civil war on wars, which occurred during World War I in Spain. Now we'll situate Spain. Um, as you see, Spain is surrounded by allied countries and even borders one of them, France. Um, Spain also controls some strategic ter terri oh, territory, oh, territories sorry, in Africa. <coughs> Uh, such as the Canary Islands, which are still part of Spain, Spanish Sahara, now Western Sahara, part of Morocco, although still a disputed territory, the Spanish Protectorate of Morocco, uh, France and Spain divided among them their areas of influence in Morocco, and at this point Spain was fighting a war against the natives. Uh, this is now part of Morocco, although Spain still has two cities in it, Ceuta and Melilla, which have fences around them. Spain also controls Spanish Guinea, which is now the country of Equatorial Guinea. Um, this is the European part of Spain. The Balearic Islands are strategic in the Mediterranean. Within Spain's mainland, we should note Gibraltar, in the south, um, which was and still is a British territory, something that Spaniards are not very happy about, as you can imagine. Uh, Madrid, its capital, is in the center of the peninsula, and Barcelona, the second biggest city and biggest port in the northeast, yeah, is in the northeast and closer to the border with France. Barcelona is also the capital of the Catalonia region, which debated and is still debating its independence from Spain. Both Barcelona and the north of Spain during this time had a flourishing industry, whereas the south and center were more agricultural and poorer. I'd also like to point out the location of Spain on the border between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, bodies of water that both linked and separated Spain from Europe and the Americas. And also in the border between Europe and Africa, which has always been at the root of debates about the essence of Spain as both European and very different from the rest of Europe. Now we're going to see a brief timeline of this period. The First and Second World War are something everybody probably knows. Uh, Spain didn't participate in either of them, at least officially, although some Spanish volunteers enlisted to fight both wars in the French Foreign Legion, and a Spanish division was sent by General Franco to help the German army in the Eastern Front during World War II. You may also know about the Spanish Civil War, which is considered by many a prelude to World War II because its proximity in time, because Germany and Italy helped Franco's army, they tried out some techniques in Spain, and because in it they fought two of the main forces which will define Europe in the 20th century, fascism and communism. What we will see today is something less explored. It's what happened in Spain during World War I. So we're gonna see this relationship instead of this one, that is the one that is being more studied. Can the Spanish Civil War be not only the start of World War II, but also the consequence of World War I even if Spain remained neutral in both conflicts. Mm, to explore all of this, we need some context. This period in Spain is called the Bourbon Restoration because the Bourbon 
uh, royal dynasty was restored in Spain after Spain's first republic, republic meaning the absence of a king, and until the second republic. There were two kings during this period, Alfonso XII, who died at the age of 27 while his wife was pregnant, with who will be the next king, Alfonso XIII, who was king since before he was born. Uh, they were hoping he would be male, otherwise the throne would have gone to his eldest sister. Uh, he was officially proclaimed king when he was 16, and before then his mother, Maria Cristina, was regent. During Maria Cristina's regency, Spain lost its last colonies in the Atlantic and the Pacific, an event you might remember as the Spanish-American War, that in Spain is remembered as the Guerra de Cuba, Cuban War, or El Desastre de Cuba, the disaster of Cuba, after which Spain had to rethink its role as a former empire, having become then only a nation. In addition, Spain was fighting a long war in northern Morocco. During the majority of the Restoration period, there were political parties and presidents, so the king didn't have all the power. Uh, and the system called Turno Pacifico, or Peaceful Turn, in which liberal and conservative parties took turns in power, brought about not exactly fair elections, but at least stability. This system ended after World War I, uh, and this is one significant consequence the war had in neutral Spain. Spain neutrality was ordered by the government of King Alfonso on August 7, 1914, and a notice was published in the official state bulletin ordering the strictest neutrality to all Spanish subjects in the European conflict. So there it says, ordenando a los subditos españoles la más estricta neutralidad en el actual conflicto europeo. The reasons for it might be summed up in the words of Ignacio de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, en tiempo de tribulación no hacer mudanza. So in time of desolation, do not make any change. Spain's army was not ready to fight a modern war because it was still not completely recovered from the Spanish-American War and it was fighting another war in Morocco. In addition, King Alfonso believed in European monarchy and could not easily pick a side. His mother, descended from an Austro-Hungarian dynasty, whereas his wife was from a British royal family. Also, Spain's economic and trade interests were tied to the allied countries because of proximity. Um, had Spain fought World War I, it would have had to be on the allies' side, otherwise the country would risk an economic debacle. Germany, thus, was hoping for Spain's neutrality. In turn, allied countries were not completely thrilled about Spain entering the war because of Spain's territorial demands, which included Gibraltar, the British colony in southern Spain, Tangier in northern Morocco, and control over Portugal, so a, a lot. Um, Spain's tired army and a strategic position and its possible spirit, spiritual influence in Catholic countries and Latin America was not enough to compensate the eventual loss of these territories. During the conflict, the country itself was divided and two wars were created, Germanophilos, uh, so that means the supporters of Germany, who, with very few exceptions, supported neutrality, and aliadophilos, who were usually vocal about Spain participating in the war. Broadly speaking, the supporters 
of Germany were the clergy, the court, the aristocracy, the landowners, the traditional upper and middle class, the army, and most citizens who lived in Castilla, the center part of Spain. They saw the German Empire as the represent representative of monarchy, religion, order, and fortitude that Spain should model. They were also moved by their hatred for Britain and France uh, because of the British occupation of Gibraltar, the French invasion to Spain at the beginning of the 19th century, the problems with France in Morocco, and a long history of disputes. Uh, they would argue for neutrality, and they would call it patriotic. Spain should not enter a fight that was considered foreign. The main supporters of the Allies were the intellectuals, the liberals, the labor mov movement, the regionalists, the republicans, which in Spain means left-leaning, that is the people who oppose having a king, and most citizens of coastal industrial cities. They defended democracy and liberalism against German autocracy and barbarism, they would call it. They also saw the Allies as the only ones that could side with the labor movement and in Catalonia with Catalan nationalism. Um, okay, I'm um, sorry. So even if the official position in Spain was neutral, tensions between aliadophilos and germanophilos were so high that they are believed to have provoked divorces and physical fights in theaters and other public events, which led to the eventual prohibition of public events that represented the war in Spain. King Alfonso, however, dreamed of Spain as a neutral power that could facilitate conversations among the belligerents. And now we're going to see a happy story about neutrality. Uh, this dream didn't win up coming true, but he did start an office in his palace to help find missing people from both sides, prisoners, wounded soldiers, and to provide information to families, deliver correspondence or goods to the front lines, and to intercede for pardons and commutations of sentences. His office was known as the Oficina Pro Cautivos, or Office for Captives. It started when a French maid wrote the king to ask for help in finding her missing husband. Alfonso mobilized the Spanish embassies in Paris and Berlin, found her husband in a German prison, and personally wrote a letter to her explaining where he was and assuring her he was interceding so they would let her send him a letter. This single act of kindness appeared in many newspapers and caught international attention, so it went viral. Uh, many people began to write letters to the king and his office, which started only with himself and his secretary, ended up having a staff of three diplomats and 40 clerks who read and responded all of the many letters that arrived each day, eventually reaching 20,000 a month and totaling half a million. So this was the office, Procaptis, that's the staff, and that's part of the, of the office. The office provided aid to around 140,000 prisoners, repatriated and repatriated 21,000 sick prisoners and 70,000 civilians. Spanish officers visited 4,000 hospitals and war camps and secure the commutation of 102 death sentences. Among those who wrote Alfonso, or were helped by him, were the famous French actor Maurice Chevalier, the British Nobel Pla Prize winner Rudyard Kipling, and the Russian royal family, of course. Uh, to fund this enterprise, King Alfonso used only his own money and private donations. This didn't cost a cent to the Spanish state. And according to some sources, he spent the equivalent of six million euros of today. 
Because of his work, the international press called Alfonso the Royal Knight of Charity and the Angel of Mercy, and he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1917, which was won by the International Committee of the Red Cross. This is a photo of Alfonso in the cover of Time magazine in 1923, and this is a portrait where he looks a little younger. Uh, there is no doubt that in this case, neutrality meant helping and being actively involved in the common good. Uh, however, the Great War infiltrated neutral Spain in more violent ways, especially through Germany's submarine campaign, which intensified in, 19, in 1917. Even though the AG Convention of 1907 established strict rules for neutral powers, during the Great War, an estimated 70 Spanish neutral ships were sunk, most of them by German submarines. According to some sources, Spain lost around 25% of its total tonnage. As you can imagine, this provoked many diplomatic incidents, and Spain was very close to entering the war in 1916, after the sinking of the ship San Fulgencio, and even, even gave Germany an ultimatum. But in the end, the politicians who were hoping to enter the war didn't find enough support within the Spanish parliament and its divided society. Uh, paradoxically, defenders of Germany, who were very upset at the occupation of Gibraltar by the British, took the sinking of Spanish ships with equanimity, even defending Germany's right to warfare. Whereas left-leaning Spaniards usually anti-militarist, supported the intervention of Spain in the war with great devotion. In spite of the constant, constant attacks and the diplomatic struggles, Spain did not stop Germany, um, Germany submarines warfare, helped some German ships when they were malfunctioning, and was never fully compensated for the ships that were lost. This resulted in political stability, diplomatic humiliations, and the loss of quite a few Spanish lives. Um, as an aside, probably the most famous Spaniard that died in the submarine war was the composer Enrique Granados. Uh, he was not in a Spanish ship, he was in a British one. He was coming back to Spain from the US. He had performed in New York City and later was invited to a private recital for President Wilson. This invitation caused him to miss his Spanish boat back to Spain, so he took a British ship which was torpedoed by a German U-boat. He drowned, not from the torpedo, torpedo, but trying to rescue his wife. So that's love. Uh, many other not famous Spanish sailors lost their lives while working in Spanish merchants that were attacked by Germany. And many parts of society accused the government of not doing enough to defend the Spanish lives. These are some examples of the public outrage taken from newspapers of the period. Um, in these two cartoons, we see specters of dead sailors who come back to hunt well-dressed politicians who are oblivious to the suffering. Here, there is a Spaniard helping a German U-boat, as many did, profiting from the war. Here we see ways of remembering the growing number of Spanish dead sailors, so they were at this point 99, um, and a flyer that shows all the lost ships um, to argue that Spain is really at war with Germany, even though not officially. The Great War was also felt in Spain through the presence of many international spies. German spies infiltrated Spain very early on. They collected information and tried to incite strikes and sabotage the factories that made weapons for the Allies, as well as the transportation systems, including the port of Barcelona. Upon realizing German influence in Spain, 
the Allies established their own counter-espionage agencies. This was all relatively tolerated by the Spanish government. There were professional spies, like the famous Mata, uh, Mata Hari, who worked from Madrid on several occasions. The German military attaché in Spain, Major Arnold von Kalle, was the one who ended up outing her as a double agent. Major Kalle was in charge of the information service in Spain, and from his office in Madrid, he communicated with France, Morocco, Great Britain, the US, and South America. Mm. Embassy personnel of several countries and many international citizens who lived in Spain acted as spies. Um, and of course, Spanish citizens were also a source of information for both sides, usually in exchange for money. Every profession was involved in the information business. Sailors, waitress, maids, singers, prostitutes, hotel personnel of all kinds, mailmen, journalists, police, mayors, politicians. <laughs> uh, only the Spanish Civil Guard, which is the oldest law enforcement agency in Spain, had a reputation of being impossible to buy off. Many women were also spies. It's particularly interesting the case of Pilar Millán Astray, who was a famous writer and the sister of José Millán Astray, the founder and first commander of the Spanish Legion, who will also be a major figure in Franco's early regime. She was a widow with three children and needed money, so, as many other women of the time, she spied on the people who entered and left important hotels in Barcelona. That's how she started a friendship with the British ambassador, went up to his room and copied documents from his wallet to send to the Germans. She would receive 1,000 pesetas for each mission, which was a handsome sum of money at the time, almost risk-free, because the protection granted by her famous brother. Spain was rightly named a nest of, a spy, of spies during the period, and some of these intelligent structures were maintained until the Spanish Civil War. If the Great War clearly infiltrated the neutral country by submarine war and spies, it should be not surprised that it also affected public discourse. In the first place, Due to the high price of paper during the war, many Spanish newspapers accepted donations from foreign countries in exchange for supporting a specific political position. Here is a chart of the money accepted by Spanish newspapers. Um, so these are the newspapers. These are the donations accepted from Germany and these from the Allies. And same thing here. Um, as we can see here, uh, the total in a given month uh, from Germany was higher than the total from the Allies. So there was collusion in this case. Um, Spanish intellectuals of the period were also not neutral. Most of them, what we would call public intellectuals, had in mind the Dreyfus affair that had greatly affected France and were very aware of their role as agitators of public opinion. They wrote several manifestos supporting both sides and staged public rallies. They supported their side and they also used the Great War to discuss what kind of nation Spain ought to become. Catalan nationalism which was not a new phenomenon, was strengthened during this period, and intellectuals and volunteer soldiers who rode from the trenches linked Catalonia with France, their historic patrie, and defended a Latin race, Latin in this case, as in countries whose language comes from Latin. In Spain, pro-intervention intellectuals exploited the myth of national regeneration through war. They considered the war a revolution, and in both sides, they exploited the friend-enemy, us-versus-them rhetoric. 
arguably the most influential intellectual of the period was Miguel de Unamuno, whom Spanish students who are here will recognize as the author of Nada Menos Que Todo Un Hombre or San Manuel Bueno Martir. Um, three times he was the rector, the highest position in a university of the prestigious Universidad de Salamanca, the oldest university in the Hispanic world and the oldest still in operation. He was removed from his job in 1914, presumably for political reasons, so during the Great War period he had time and cause to publish articles against the government. His writings and speeches wonder what is the true Spain and the true Sp Spanishness. He criticizes his fellow citizens for being apathetic in a famous article called La Noluntad Nacional, which is a play in words with the word voluntad. He says noluntad. B voluntad means will, so instead of the national will, he calls it the national want. Unamuno tries to find a new future for Spain different from the old world order and instigates Spaniards to find a new way to move forward. So I have many of his quotes here, but I'm going to skip forward to the most interesting one. <laughs> so these two, um, he's talking about war. And he says, this war, it has to be said very loud and be repeated many times. It's more than a war, a European revolution. It is the revolution. As a war, it is a civil war of Europe, and all civil wars are always a revolution. And that's something that those who defend neutrality above all know very well. Spain is today in a civil war, even though we're not shooting each other. And the next quote, um, and that's why some of us proclaim the necessity of a civil war. And now, in Spain, the European war is reviving our always latent civil war and uncovering people's true temperament. Um, although in another piece he explained that he made a distinction between the civil war, which is civilized, and the military, military war, which is not civic, it's difficult not to read these sentences as a foreshadow of what was to come. A civil war is obviously not like the controversial form of divorce in India, the triple talak, that only requires the word to be said three times to become effective, but starting a conversation about the benefits of a civil war is definitely a dangerous practice which puts the idea and the justification in people's minds. Um, well, I'm just gonna, there's too many quotes maybe. Through words, Spain participated discursively of the Great War, rethinking its, space in the m its place in the map of global modernity. Of course, for many Spanish intellectuals, the war was not as much a change of paradigm, but a catalyzer of incipient ideas. The neutrality in the war provoked dialogues and sharp divisions within. Instead of di directing hostility towards a common foreign enemy, Spaniards fought among themselves for the vision of their country they would like to pursue. The Great War had other important consequences in Spain that I don't have time to explore. Spain's economy and its bank system grew immensely, and at the same time there was massive inflation and scarcity of products, which provoked food riots, sometimes severely repressed, and not to mention the Spanish flu. Uh, politically and socially, the Great War was a very unstable period for Spain. The events in Europe sparked domestic disturbances. There were general strikes organized by the emergent labor movement, several government crises, military discontent and revolts, and Catalan nationalism, all while the country was fighting a long colonial war in Morocco. Historian Francisco Romero Salvador 
argues that the events of the Great War provoked the fall of the political system, the Turno Pacifico, in which the two main parties took turns to be in power. For Romero Salvador, when General Primo de Rivera took power and started a military dictatorship in 1923, he, quote, did not overthrow the last constitutional government. He merely limited himself to filling a vacuum which had existed ever since 1917." Unquote. Let's now see Spain's timeline between the Great War and the Civil War. Mm. Okay. In 1920, Spain's army suffered a great loss in Morocco known as the Desastre the annual. In 1923, as I mentioned, Miguel Primo de Rivera performed a coup d'etat and he secured the support of the king, the army, and the industrial bourgeoisie. The first two years in power, he had a military directory and later he had a civilian directory. He managed to end the war in Morocco and suppressed Catalan nationalism. However, he ended up losing the support of the king, who named a different general to be in power. He died shortly after, but his son Jose Antonio and daughter Pilar were the two main ideologists of Francisco Franco's regime. The next short period is called La Dicta Blanda, which is a play on words with the word dictadura, in which dura means hard in Spanish, whereas blanda means soft. Berenguer's government didn't last long. Free elections were finally called, and they became a referendum on the king, who was blamed for all the political instability. The anti-monarch or republican parties won, and Alfonso abdicated and went into exile in France. It's highly paradoxical that Alfonso, who's not especially well remembered in Spain because of all the convulsion during his reign and because he ended up leaving the country, was received in France with tremendous popular support because French people remember how much he personally helped many citizens during the Great War. Apparently, he was received by a multitude of French men and women who followed him everywhere to thank him while they chanted, Vive le Roi, or Long Live the King. And this is a country famous for beheading their own monarchy. Um, meanwhile, Spain started the Second Republic, a very progressive period, but also a very convulsed one. For example, among many other things, the Republican government tried a very much needed agrarian reform established the separation between church and state, and legalized divorce. The various governments ran into problems with several sectors of society who opposed the reforms or who suffered economic scarcity. And there were viol violent revolts and a general climate of insecurity. In 1936, after the general elections were won by a coalition of left-wing parties, the army rose up against the government and General Francisco Franco, who was at the time deployed in Morocco, led his soldiers into the peninsula and fought a three-year civil war that he ended up winning in 1939 with the support of Germany and Italy. He established an authoritarian regime and remained in power until 1975 with no king this time, and with only one legal political party. Spain's neutrality during the Great War, for some historians, such as Gerald Meeker, who coined the expression a civil war of wars to refer to the period, meant the continuation of the monarchy. However, even if that's immediately true, because Alfonso didn't abdicate until some years later, it can also be argued that the events of the Great War provoked the eventual fall of the monarchy and the old political system and the start of new ones that were not always democratic. Spanish historians and literary scholars tend to divide Spain's history between pre-Civil War 
and post-Civil War, which makes sense because the material conditions and the culture change drastically. But we can also attempt to consider the Great War as a turning point is in Spain's history. Spain's neutrality during the war brought positive consequences, such as humanitarian diplomacy. It enabled Germany, by not acting against the submarine warfare and the race of spies, and it functioned as a workshop for political ideas that were put in practice during the rest of the century. Finally, um, neutrality, which I hope to have demonstrated, is a multifaceted concept, concept we can discuss further in the Q&A, can also make us rethink the meaning of world war. Perhaps called as such, because even though not all countries in the world officially fought in it, it definitely affected the world's transnational and national outlooks of the past and their visions for the future. Thank you very much.